Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Doug Brunke, founder and CEO of Global Chamber, and we've got a really great conversation today because the second largest country in the world is India, and there is something happening every moment of every day there. 85% of business is happening over the next five years outside the U.S., and a lot of that is in India. So we're going to be talking about some opportunities there. We're going to be talking to three tremendous experts who are right in the midst of all of the happenings. They're all, I believe, zooming in today from India. We had a fourth person, Jagat Shah, who is also an extraordinary business leader in India, who unfortunately had a plane that got delayed, and he be joining us today. So we'll include him on the next one. So our first speaker today is Aparna Ranadive. She's our Global Chamber Mumbai Executive Director. And Aparna, I've seen your presentation, so it looks like you're going to give us a, a really great foundational view of what's happening in India today. So thank you very much for sharing that in advance. Well, thank you, Doug. It was a pleasure working on it. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, to, to get started, uh, I think we're living in exciting times in, in the country today. So, I'm just going to give you a, a sort of a perspective into uh, uh, the overall happenings, uh, a, little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of almost everything that's there, the kind of reforms that have been uh, brought in, and therefore, which makes trade and uh, development far more... Uh, easy and far more exciting to be in India at this point in time. Uh, so as you can, uh, as, as the world is aware, uh, we're a young nation. Uh, the average age of the, of the people in the nation is about 29 years with about 50% of its population below the age of 25 and more than 65 below the age of 35. So we have a long way to go and um, we're a fairly young uh, lot. Uh, India is gearing up to be one of the top three uh, economic powers in the world in the next 10 to 15 years. And therefore, reforms, therefore, activities, and therefore, all the changes are being made to sort of uh, stride in that direction. The political situation is far more stable as compared to what it was a few years ago. And that makes uh, entry from uh, international partners uh, far more uh, easier. And in fact, uh, when, when our prime minister took the um, chair about uh, five years ago, uh, he did, uh, the first thing that he did was to start making strategic connections across the globe and which is, and, and making those relations uh, strong, which, which obviously enables uh, the trade and development. Uh, India is expected to be the third largest consumer con uh, economy, considering the young population that we have, uh, the, the uh, economic power uh, and the earning capacity that the younger lot has got. And of course, the global exposure that considering their age and their education and their uh, uh, exposure to the global um, population. Uh, and therefore, uh, the consumer behavior is such that uh, they're, they're exposed to uh, world products and, and um in every sense, and therefore they will be the we will be the third largest uh, economy in terms of consumers as well. Um, India has been in the in the last few years we've seen close to about four thousand seven hundred and fifty or technology uh, startups in the country, uh, and and in different fields of technology, which again enables countries and companies from different aspects and different areas of work to come and uh, try out the Indian waters. Uh, we have a growth story to talk about. Uh, we're gearing up again to become um, a three trillion uh, dollar uh, uh, economy in the next uh, uh, by about 2019. Uh, we were uh, we were about uh, our, our GDP has increased by 50 percent. And one of the reasons why I'm giving you this perspective is so that you know, how, how excited people are about the growth story, how we are growing as, an, as a country, as an economy, and therefore how uh, lucrative a, a place it is for international partners to come and set up shop in India and to grow with us in the growing of the, uh, economy. Um, during 2018 and 19, we have, uh, we have had merchandise exports from India, uh, which have increased by about 8.85%. Uh, to about, uh, uh, you know, a year-on-year -year growth of about $85.51 billion. 
uh and again uh, india has become the most attractive uh, emerging uh, market for the global partners for investment in the coming 12 months um in all of this that while that it was happening uh, the fdi regulations the foreign uh, investment regulations that have, uh, that the government has made changes to has again made it easier for um for international uh, companies to come and set up uh, uh, and invest uh, their money in the country there is a direct uh, a method through which they can come and also there is a government required approval so the ones that have uh, that i have talked about as an automatic route is uh, is obviously the ones that do not require uh, government uh, approval now the com- the country has also initiated uh, two or three very key initiatives one is of course the make in india which is boosting the manufacturing uh, sector in its sense uh which is which is also investing in uh, local manufacturing uh, capabilities and increasing those capabilities across the board so across different sectors the manufacturing capability is being increased uh digital india we're looking at creating india into a digital economy uh, a digital uh, country and a far more digital literacy infrastructure Uh, and the uh, and delivering digital services across the globe again that becomes a lot more easier for technologically advanced uh, uh, economies and uh, countries to make their strides in india and and be connected and make the world still a smaller place than it is today um earlier on india used to be looked at as a com- as a country which had a high level of bureaucracy and which prevented international partners from entering into Or, or, or they were wary about entering into the Indian uh, waters, but now it is uh, the ease of doing businesses. Um, you know, the the red tapeism has been cut down. The uh, single window clearances that have been started. Uh, you know, the the fast clearances of of uh, certain proposals that have taken place, um, and also setting up of limited liability companies and otherwise uh, in the ROC as well, in the registrar of companies as well. uh the kind of initiatives that have taken have considerably cut down on the red tape and has considerably cut down on the bureaucracy which was earlier existing and again that makes it a lot more easier for uh, partnerships to be developed and for uh, uh, you know for for more companies to be set up now certain sectors where uh, which could be of interest to many of you here uh, 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 where where the fdi investment has been uh, relaxed in so many words is uh, one is of course the defense sector where considering it is a government in a uh, uh, you know relevance uh, sector the uh, fdi investment is limited to 49% but they are still look, taking a look at how they can increase it further retail has been a, a rising uh, sector in the country uh, and therefore uh, single brand uh, retail companies uh, uh, you know could come and establish again that's a 100% automatic route you don't need to go through the government telecommunication media and entertainment uh, hotels and tourism we have always been as a country as a culture we've always encouraged uh, people to come and visit us uh, we we operate on the principle that we see the almighty in our guest uh, and that is what the the fundamental principle has been of the country and therefore we encourage a lot of host, uh, hotels and tourism as a business and again there there is a 100% uh, fdi investment possibility under the uh, uh, under the automatic route uh, and of course there is there is tax uh, a holiday given to uh, you know hotels being set up around the unesco approved world heritage sites uh, medical tourism has always been on the uh, you know has always been on the radar and therefore it is uh, it's it's likely to be uh, set up uh, you know given more importance education with a lot of international institutions coming into the country uh, education has been given a 100% automatic uh, route uh, in terms of fdi uh, the other sectors being um, uh, food product retail uh, whether it is animal husbandry whether it is manufacturing of medical devices again real estate is a is a though the sector is right now not doing tremendously well but nonetheless there is a there is a 100% under the uh, automatic route uh, availability for the fdi investment uh, e-commerce as a sector again is is very uh, lucrative and it's coming up in a big way 
Some of the other sectors uh, that have uh, shown uh, some improvement and some promise, or rather a lot of promise uh, today, uh, is definitely the digital transformation uh, area. Artificial intelligence is being used uh, considerably ac across many of this, or rather most of the sectors today, uh, where um, artificial intelligence uh, uh, interfaces have been developed, have, uh, you know, and, and platforms are being created. Uh, from the media and entertainment sectors, again, in terms of virtual reality, uh, um, augmented reality, whether it is animation, whether it is visual effects, that is the, you know, the quality of movie making, the quality of uh, movie watching has also improved. And therefore, there is a lot of uh, scope for these kind of uh, industries to come in. Indian goods in terms of handicrafts or whether it is, uh, you know, Indian, Indian products, be it spices, be it uh, clothes, be it, uh, you know, multiple other uh, uh, products, they've always been in demand. Uh, and, and definitely that sector has seen growth. Uh, so that, uh, you know, and, and now, of course, considering uh, one more uh, state having got a union territory kind of a, a, a approval, uh, mainly uh, Jammu Kashmir and even the Ladakh area, uh, there will, uh, uh, and, and with relaxations being made in terms of whether it is investments, in land or whether it is um, you know other investments there will be a huge opportunity available once this, uh, the political situation uh, sort of stabilizes there uh, in terms of education in terms of real estate in terms of tourism tourism is definitely a huge area in those area, uh, in those uh, provinces so i think all in all india is 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 an exciting story to be a part of uh, in the, in the next uh, coming decade it's a it's a wave to be riding on and we welcome each and every one of you to come and, um, you know, uh, uh, and, and establish your uh, trade here. If there is any requirement from Bombay or from any other places, I'm sure the team here is available and Doug will, Doug and Caesar is definitely there to guide us all. Uh, we will definitely be a part of, uh, you know, the growth story here of the Global Chambers and of India, of course. Over to you, Doug. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Oparna. That was one of the better overviews I've seen of all the different countries we've had. So really appreciate you doing such a complete job there. There are a number of questions already in. And so those wow. of you who are watching around the world, send in your questions through the Q&A. Uh, you can also send it to the uh, email info at globalchamber.org. And uh, one way or another, we'll look to answer uh, those questions at the uh, last 30 minutes of this program. So we're going to be going for uh, 60 minutes plus minus, uh, nothing plus, all minus. We're not going to go over 60 minutes. And so we'll spend as much time as we can listening to our speakers and then uh, answering your questions. Uh, the next speaker um, is um, uh, coming in from uh, 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 Bangalore, I believe, today, Vinay Kulkami. He's the founder and CEO of Alchemy. That's A-L-C-H-M-I, as in alchemy, the one with chemistry and excitement and things. And so I think that's a great transition from what Aparna talked about in the sense that Vinay is in the midst of all sorts, helping companies in India and helping companies around the world take advantage of some of these opportunities. So Vinay, uh, welcome. Thank you for your uh, collaboration and your membership in Global Chamber, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Doug. So that was a great overview uh, by Aparna. So I've been asked to talk about um, uh, marketing um, in India. So um, really quick, uh, we are Alchemy, and uh, we can take care of all your marketing needs under one roof. Um, to learn more, you can visit alchemy.com. Um, so Aparna has already given a very detailed overview um, about India as a market, but some stats of um, interest for companies looking to market in India, um, I put up on the screen here. Uh, important to note the number of languages uh, spoken by more than 10,000 people. So officially you can say there are 22 languages. So in addition to um, mastering your marketing in English, um, depending on your target audience within the country, uh, you might have to master a number of other languages. 
So um, I'm going to share some ideas or tips or pointers with respect to marketing in India. Um, so marketing is marketing strategy is strategy. So the principles uh, don't change except that uh, you're actually marketing to many countries within one country. So um, your strategy needs to be that much more um, broad and detailed. And it's a good idea to work with someone uh, on the ground who understands the nuances uh, of the Indian culture and sensibilities um, and uh, take their input when you're developing marketing strategies, communication strategies, and so on. Uh, I'd also say uh, assumptions uh, about your audience can be risky. So you really have to do your research when you're marketing uh, in India. Number two, um, actually following on, on the same, on the first point, uh, you have to segment. So um, that's the most important thing in India. Uh, and you cannot uh, make assumptions. You need to um, really understand what drives each segment. And um, you know, it's complex but it can be understood, it takes time. Um, and what works in rural areas may not work in urban areas and so on. Um, and you really need to tailor your strategies to the segment. Again, um, this is uh, standard marketing advice anywhere. You got you to tell a story about your brand, um, but how you do it in India may be a little different. Uh, you have to, uh, content is still king, but uh, emotion is paramount. So um, you need to adapt your storytelling to the specific audience within India that you're targeting. Uh, I have seen a number of uh, examples where the key message of the brand was lost in translation. So um, you, need, you really need to do your work as far as um, crafting your message. Um, the other point is, you know, the first two points I said, you have to have a detailed strategy. At the same time, you have to be ready to improvise on the go because on the ground situations um, can be very different. And, um, you know, in, in, in the Indian context, um, you always have to be ready to improvise. And you need to think through exactly um, how the users are going to uh, use your products and make it part of their life. You really need to have the whole um, user journey mapped out and uh, make sure that there are no roadblocks um, for them to you know, use your products or services. Um, I've seen a few examples where uh, the product or the service was really great, but um, the detailed thinking was not involved and there were some roadblocks that were not removed, um, which uh, delayed the adoption by the, uh, by the market. Um, digital is on the rise. Um, you know, we've already crossed more than 500 million uh, internet users in India uh, and uh, probably 800 million mobile users. So uh, definitely digital is in and mobile is in. At the same time, um, combining digital with physical uh, can work better in the Indian context. Um, I found that compared to the US market, there are lots more opportunities for uh, low budget, low cost marketing in India, uh, if you can be creative. And of course, do not forget the mobile. Um, it's a mobile economy and um, the number of mobile users are uh, continuously growing in India. And um, the adoption curve for a new app and so on is uh, really fast. Um, when the demonetization was happening and the government was pushing people to adopt uh, mobile and Paytm and so on, um, the adoption was really rapid. So, um, you know, it's a great opportunity as far as mobile marketing is concerned. Um, but again, you need to think through the details. So those are a few pointers from me. 
and uh, I'll hand it back to Doug. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you, Vinay. Um, our next speaker, uh, we're going to go con continue with the story about what are some of the opportunities and how do you take advantage of those. Our next speaker is actually someone who's a friend of Global Chamber for many years from the U.S. side and now uh, from the India side. Prabh Akara Ogavali is uh, an investor, uh, a exporter and importer. He's involved with every aspect of business and uh, back and forth between India and other countries. And just a uh, prob, uh, congratulations on your success. I know today you're going to be talking about some of the things both for us to consider and, and some of them you're involved with directly. So thank, thank you very much for your membership and your, your intellect and also sharing your expertise today. Hi, Doug. Hi, Doug and uh, fellow panelists uh, and the people who have signed in all over the globe. Okay, I have been a, an entrepreneur through my life and uh, mostly I have experienced both the Indian and the American systems a lot. Uh, regarding India, I now consider it the land of opportunity. I believe we used to say about this in the United States, but uh, the so U.S. has a high per capita income and the third largest population in the world. India has the largest growth. We have the highest growth among all countries, developing, developed, and uh, underdeveloped, whatever. And uh, the policy initiatives, various domains, etc. Parna has already told you. In the last five years, we have experienced a lot of lot of vibrancy in the Courses direct investment. Uh, lots of companies are looking to work in India in manufacturing. And though we can never match metric by metric versus China, we are not the uh, most cheap, you know, efficient labor, cheapest power, best infrastructure. But we are still chasing that. And services, we are definitely the best in the world. More than 350 Fortune 500 companies are having some amount of service operations from India. Even though both of them being such, I am uh, campaigning for investment in healthcare. We have a large population, which is a captive audience for us, and it's a captive customer. And unlike goods, services cannot be imported from a more efficient manufacturing environment. So the healthcare needs have to be met here and there, here, here, right here. So we have a typical non-communicable diseases like hypertension. We have the world's largest diabetic population and we have other uh, uh, non-communicable diseases in a very high incidence. And uh, some amount of prosperity is also bringing in some other diseases. So healthcare is a huge uh, opportunity. A lot of foreign investment has already come in. I am going to share with you interested people a document on uh, how the investment has already come in and so on. And uh, healthcare was predominantly in the public domain. About 50 years ago, we had the Canada model or the UK model where the government did everything and the best hospitals were run in the public domain. But it is slowly gravitating. It has already gravitated towards the private domain now. So healthcare is predominantly in the private hands, in the private investment. And uh, I'm soliciting, uh, I'm campaigning for investment in healthcare because there are a lot of government incentives. Typically, governments give the land free or at a very subsidized cost. And then project finance is available from, uh, available from uh, banks. They give at least 60% of the project. We can get funding. And the large population is a captive uh, customer. Certain, uh, I'm in the southern part of the country when I'm not in the U.S., and the southern parts are, uh, you know, more organized, more tax paying and, you know, more uh, compliant, I would say. And uh, 
and no offense to my other participants from wherever. And in my state of Andhra Pradesh and the neighboring states, newly formed states of Chhattisgarh, Orissa, we have a huge incentives in uh, the government is giving really good incentives for installation of uh, uh, medical facilities. And while the healthcare is as is a good business, it's going to be very, uh, very profitable with practically zero risk. And uh, another uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention was that uh, our country also, the poor people, I mean, middle class and lower middle class are anyhow getting a kind of insurance from the state. So when they come and get treated, the payment is already made by the local government. So the hospitals have a um, way easier task of uh, getting their money. And middle class and higher middle class population is anyway going towards private insurances. Just like in the US, again, we are copying the US model. Everybody who can afford now have their own healthcare coverage. So we have a similar model like in the US, there is a Medicare kind of a coverage provided by the government and there is private insurance which charges more but pays better. So a new establishment will primarily cater to uh, like a 10 million population town or city, but, and they will more than make up by providing the healthcare services and uh, I am proposing that people interested in investment in healthcare look at one unique opportunity, which is uh, patient clinical trials. When pharma companies develop drugs and they have tested lots of tests are complete and US FDA has approved for clinical trials, they are looking for patients with those indications. If I have a stomach ulcer and if a new medicine has come, I need patients with that kind of indication and also in sufficient numbers. Because of our huge population, we have a, we have typically in a hospital, we get 500 new unique patients a day. So those are a lot of numbers and a drug company, a pharma company which wants to conduct trials, readily find patients with the required indications. And then compliance and insurance and malpractice litigation and you know personal injury compensations are not that much as in the West. So conducting a clinical trial and finding a willing subject are far easier in, the, in my country. And drug companies will pay heavily if we can do those trials. So a hospital we will establish to provide healthcare. It's a viable business by itself. However, by offering to do clinical trials and then by documenting and by reporting the results and by being able to use those technologies and also be able to provide the back office we will be a very competitively positioned and very profitable business. So I'm very uh, interested to do that. I'm qualified to offer this because my son is a doctor. He has studied management in Europe and he worked with Novartis for some time on empirical drugs and uh, drugs that want uh, clinical trials. So, Healthcare is still kind of underserviced in India. Not the cities are all right, but the villages and rural areas are still not having the one doctor to thousand patients that the WHO requires. So it's a huge opportunity. And policy is favorable, like Aparna said, and all the other indices are pointing towards a growth in India. So please let me know, ask questions. Anything else I can answer, please ask. Thanks, Doug. Over to you, Doug. Thank you very much, Prab. And whichever of the three of you have
the street noise in the background, we really appreciate you giving us a sense of India in every aspect. So thank you, thank you very much for that uh, background noise. We really appreciate it. It gives us all. Uh, we are having any background noise? Okay. It's wonderful. Yeah. Pos possibly coming in from my side. My window's open. <laughs> yeah, we don't want too much, but, uh, but but we do appreciate the the honking in the background. It, it means. <laughs> Um, but while we, while we have you, Prab, um, and, and of course, those of you who are watching, ask questions through the Q&A or at info at globalchamber.org. First question for you, Prab, um, without you maybe going into the specifics of something okay. that you're working on, if you could explain more, what, do, what does a hospital project look like in India? What, you know, like how big is it? How long does it take? You know, what kind yeah. of things required? What, what does kind of like end to end, what does one of those projects look like? Yeah, the hospital project typically costs about, uh, uh, typically costs about uh, uh, 25 US million. And the land cost is about 5 million, but land cost is typically either negligible or free okay okay the equipment cost is about 20 million a really comprehensive 600 to 1000 bed hospital requires an investment of a total of 25 million okay and a typically unique new patients is 500 to 700 per day there is no death of patients and those people who cannot afford, the bill is paid by the government. And private people who can afford, they are mostly coming under insurance now. So a 25 million investment within five years can be recovered entirely. And if we did clinical trials and if we had some niche uh, like we are trying, the drug companies will be so happy to either co-invest with us or pay us for patient or so, so it will be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on a, I could do a hospital by myself, but if I partnered somebody with, uh, you know, experience or capital from overseas, we could do a chain and India has uh, so much potential that you know, we could do a chain of hospitals, about four or five in all the underserviced areas. Got it. Yeah, and so, um, again, I think I mentioned it, but just to be sure, if you need to get a hold of anybody who's speaking today, you know, contact us, uh, info at globalchamber.org, and we're happy to connect you. Uh, how many, Ben Prob, how many hospitals are required in India every year. I mean, it sounds like it's a pretty big number given, you know, the, the size. Yeah, of I'd say currently we don't have that many, as many as needed. So we are getting FDI and I have a chart, but they were expecting that uh, US uh, dollar, US dollar in healthcare, we need an investment close to 100 million more a year at least just, just in that one city yeah it's about four five hospitals yeah about 100 million per year of overseas investment they're looking for in india i see okay well, very very good um yes so, um going back um to um the bureaucracy and the reduction, and I presume tariffs are part of that. I was looking up, uh, maybe Aparna, you could address this. Um, the, the India's ranking in the easiest companies or countries to do business dropped from 100, the 100th most difficult or easiest country down to the 77th. So advanced That's right. spaces, so it's getting easier to do business. Yes. So do you expect this trend to continue given what you talked about relative to the, the current government? Um, and, and will do you expect that government to be in place for a while? Uh, well, at least for the next five years, they, uh, they 
they hopefully should be there so uh, at least that's the minimum period that they will be there and uh, considering the uh, uh, the uh, you know the, the kind of emphasis that they are giving on to uh, making a show that uh, you know the the uh, ease of business is, is ease of doing business has is increasing uh, i think uh, you know the uh, the number uh, at which we stand today will definitely uh, tend to uh, improve over the next few years um, and and the and also considering the kind of technological investments that we are making uh, that will also uh, aid in in uh, you know the ease of doing business in itself when the whole digitization happens and and the uh, in the in the processes or in the documentation or the less number of documents that are required the less number of approvals that are required uh, i think uh, the, you know the the ease of doing business in india will be far improved than what it is today fantastic uh, this is a question for all of you. Um, the, the, the question is, if, if someone hasn't been in India for 10 years and they go tomorrow, what's, what are some of the biggest surprises that they'll see? And then the second part of that question is, what surprises you every day walking through the streets, you know, taking the subway? What, what are some of the things that surprise you that are happening in India uh, today? Who, who would like to start that question? Can I jump in? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think for somebody who's not been in India for the last 10 years, um, it's, it's going to be a, a dramatic change for that person to where India was about 10 years ago and where it is today. Uh, the, the, uh, there has been a lot of uh, changes, of course, over the last few years in terms of infrastructure, uh, whether it is in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the travel ease, um, the, the number of the number of people have of course gone up so that definitely will be surprising even we when we walk down the street we say there's so many people around but uh, you know the, the certain areas and if I speak from a perspective of Bombay uh, there's so many places within Bombay which have uh, you know which have suddenly become the uh, the business hubs which in the past maybe about 10 years ago was was the farthest end of Bombay which was called the Naravan point or church gate if if i if people know about the geography um was the southernmost tip of bombay and that was like the economic hub or the the office hub for for uh, the city and now it has moved to places centrally wherein there are so many offices a lot of co-working spaces have started so uh, you know the, the world has definitely changed um, if I look down uh, or if I look at the changes and the, the surprises that I see every day is, is this whole uh, uh, is, is a change in the technology, the change in the telecommunication part of it, though the telecom industry in India is not doing very well right now. But uh, in the earlier days, when 10 years ago, a mobile was a luxury, which was costing, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of money. And even the per minute uh, rate was fairly high. Today, if you go down the street, you see even a, a person, a street vendor who's selling vegetables down the street or who's selling, um, who's pushing a cart of uh, fruits or who's, uh, you know, a bus conductor to a taxi driver. Everybody uh, has a mobile and it's become, uh, you know, almost like a necessity uh, these days uh, and, and not so much a luxury. And the, definitely the, the kind of telecommunication changes that have come about where you know, the call rates have dropped and, uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of uh, the 3G, 4G, 5G now that we're talking about in terms of uh, the spectrums, uh, all of that has, has really, really changed uh, the way India was about 10 years ago to where it is today. Uh, so definitely in not just the world, but India has become a smaller place uh, as well in terms of connectivity and uh, in terms of business. Fantastic. Thank you. Vinay or Prav, do you want to add to that? Yes. Um, yeah, so, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. yeah Vinay, go ahead, Vinay. Okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, I moved back to India two years ago in 2015. And what made the move um, so um, easy and effortless was two things Ola and Uber and Google Maps. So these two things made me feel like I know how to get around. I know my way around. <laughs> um, without these two things, I, you know, I wouldn't have been able to um, get around in uh, Bangalore, let alone in the rest of India. 
Um, then the other things that are happening is, um, for example, um, you go to the hospital to get your health checkup done. Um, you give a blood sample and then next day, the results are in your cell phone, in the app. And, um, you know, it's really convenient. And um, we already have um, the beginnings of telemedicine. So right now I can um, do a virtual consultation with my doctor through an app, through video or telephone. And I can set up appointments with him, email him, ask him questions, do all that. Um, so that's already, that is, that's, that's really mind blowing. Um, then airports, um, I think, uh, for me, the Bangalore airport is the, one of the best airports, uh, in the world, I would say just, um, if you have a long wait, um, the Bangalore airport is a great place to spend, uh, you know, spend your time. But then same is the case with the Mumbai airport, uh, the Delhi airport. So, uh, airports and all the major metros are really uh, transformed 360 degrees. Uh, also, I'm, I was amazed by the, uh, the speed with which uh, digital transactions caught on. So it's made life a lot easier. So uh, you no longer have to carry any cash. All you need is your cell phone. Um, and then uh, some other things that are happening is uh, everybody wears a digital watch now and it's, it, it can be annoying uh, because um, someone is looking at a blank thing on their hand while you're talking and, <laughs> and you think they're looking at time. Like, why are you looking at time so many times? They're not looking at, at the messages popping up on their, on their watch. Uh, also, um, the whole country runs on uh, Chai and WhatsApp. So uh, if, if it's WeChat in China, it's WhatsApp in India. Everything. I was really surprised when I moved here. Um, I would, you know, uh, pay someone or do a transaction and the invoice or the receipt pops up in my cell phone. Uh, <laughs> and so I really got trained on using WhatsApp by um, everybody I was interacting with. Uh, and then the internet speed, internet speed is amazing. Um, at least in Bangalore, I don't know about the, you know, other cities, but it's, it's really great here. So it makes it really easy. Um, once I um, step into my office and, and, you know, I'm behind my computer, um, I can't tell whether I'm in Bangalore or I'm in, you know, San Jose. It, it, it feels like I'm, I'm, I'm right there. So those are some, some things that I wanted to share. Fantastic, great, great summary. What about you, Prabh? You've spent a lot of time. Yeah, in I, would, uh, I would say that uh, the airports are most, because I'm traveling out of India now for 30 years. And uh, previously when I returned from the US, I used to feel our airports are so sad. I used to wonder if we will ever have an airport like uh, an airport in Atlanta, that kind of thing. But, uh, no, our airports are really catching up. The one in Bombay, Mumbai, is amazing, Doug. You must have seen also. Chhatrapati Sivaji Terminal is amazing and Bangalore. Of course, Vinay has covered, Aparna has covered, but I would like to report the airports, the internet, and the adoption of mobile phone. Three things have really, really changed. And uh, I think there are many people who use mobile phones in the US. But mobile phone app, as we use in India for everything, or maybe as they use in China for everything, is pretty advanced. Even vegetable vendors are taking money by a mobile phone, by a ATM. So I'm really, yeah, if I return 10 years, uh, I would be shocked with the uh, internet and airport, truly. <laughs> Fantastic. That's all fantastic. Um, this one probably is for mainly for Vinay, and it relates to your point around the 22 official languages and many, many other languages and, and kind of the marketing to the 
to the consumers in India. How, you, you, your experience with marketing in other countries, including the U.S. and parts of Europe and, all, and probably around the world, how do you, besides the fact that it's so segmented like that, you know, what are some of the other differences and changes and, and what are some of the things that you advise to people as they step into the market and going after the market? Uh, I'm sorry, there was a little bit of a background noise here. Um, so I missed some parts of your question. So the, is the question, what's the difference between marketing in India and, and uh, US and Europe? Fundamentally, that is the question, yes. Yeah, like I was, like I was saying um, in my uh, short presentation, um, it's, uh, it's many countries within one country. And um, you really have to understand the differences, the nuances. And you cannot get that from reading a book, you know, or, or even watching YouTube videos. So um, it, it's, it's pretty, uh, it can be pretty intricate. Um, and uh, I think the startup culture is booming, especially in uh, Bangalore. Um, there are some parts of Bangalore that feel like uh, Silicon Valley. So uh, when you're in those areas, um, you know, it doesn't feel very different. The, the mindset and, and, and how people communicate the, the language and, and what they look for is, is quite similar. But once outside of those areas, uh, there can be a lot of um, differences. A um, lot of traditional companies are, um, you know, looking to go online or uh, start e-commerce stores. Um, and a lot of traditional companies that never needed or never had a website or, or now, you know, everybody needs to have a website if you're in business. Um, but the whole concept of branding and consistency, that is the hallmark of good branding. It's still, um, you know, not yet appreciated. Um, you know, and when it comes to digital marketing, content is king, but um, the way, um, a lot of marketers are approaching content here is still, you know, not yet evolved, um, let's say to the US standards. So uh, you may find a lot of inconsistency from article to article uh, or from page to page within the same website. Um, even how the name of the company is spelled or referred, uh, you know, uh, it, it makes me cringe if I see things like that, but um, for a lot of folks here, it doesn't matter. Uh, and they still manage to uh, do what they need to do, uh, especially the small and medium sized businesses. Uh, so they have not yet matured in terms of learning how to create content that can be used to educate your customers and so on. So it's actually an opportunity for, um, uh, a business like ours, where we really understand um, the the intricacies and the nuances of branding, we are trying to educate um, people about the importance. Uh, so I'm conducting different seminars and so on. Uh, also, um, I found that um, they're still learning how to uh, articulate, you know, um, their value proposition to their target market. Uh, so they haven't still mm, figured out uh, a good way to do that. And um, that's something that I'm trying to teach, um, you know, the audience here as well. There's, there's some, some differences and uh, it can be a lot of guerrilla marketing or, you know, it's um, a lot of unconventional marketing um, tactics or strategies are possible in India that, um, probably would not be possible in US, right? Um, I, I'll have to take a very specific case to give an example, but this, the, you know, um, if you wanna do zero budget marketing or low cost marketing, uh, it's possible uh, in more ways in India than I would say um, in US. So there, there are pros and, and, and cons, right? Um, to, the, to the local situation. But if you're creative uh, and you understand the nuances of the local culture and sens sensibilities, um, you can uh, get a lot of marketing done on a, on a, 
on a low budget. Also, um, I think uh, uh, the business owners uh, in India have still a long way to go in terms of uh, being educated about what the digital medium can do for you, how fast it can do it for you, and at what cost it can do it for you. So sometimes the expectations are not realistic and um, you know, uh, they may be uh, employing a, a very simple and specific strategy, but expect a very big uh, and broad result, for example. So those are some, some examples. Uh, Aparna, I'm curious, you know, how you see it as well. Are though is that kind of how you view it? And then on building on that, what are some of the B2B markets and and B2C markets that you're seeing right now that are exploding, that are you're really quite active uh, in India? Um, okay, so I think um, I'm going to sort of add on to uh, you know. Uh, what was just said. Uh, uh, India is definitely a country within uh, many countries within a country. Uh, and I'm speaking, uh, I'm not a marketing genius, but I'm speaking more as an HR professional who've been in the, who, uh, I have been in the industry now for the last 25 odd years. Uh, and I've worked across the media and entertainment sector, the financial services sector, the retail sector, telecom and engineering. So from that perspective, uh, and today now I, I work with startups as well, and I advise and I coach uh, first and second generation entrepreneurs as well. Uh, so if I have to really look at it uh, from that perspective, um, there are, so India's, India's market is essentially uh, distributed between uh, the first generation entrepreneurs, there are the small and medium companies, there are the large MNCs as well who, who establish different kinds of companies and industries look at marketing or look at the business differently. Uh, the ownership driven companies, which are the first generation entrepreneurs or uh, maybe the, the uh, people who, who've used the brick and mortar model essentially, um, have that kind of a thinking where they expect uh, you know, a lot of returns to come from uh, uh, small ad spends or small spends on, on uh, content development or whether it is digital. But uh, these very families have had their children uh, study abroad and now they are returning back to take the, uh, you know, the, the reins of the company in their hands. So I can, uh, you know, even cite big companies uh, from for, uh, in, in that uh, direction. Uh, where, the, where the second or the third generation is now coming into the picture and they are very well educated. They're very well aware about what is happening on the other side of the world in terms of all of these strategies to be used. They're very advanced in terms of um, their understanding of the people strategies, of the marketing strategies, of how sales works or how, uh, you know, different avenues are possible today. Uh, so, for example, I am uh, associated with this company in the hospitality sector, which is uh, working on the, uh, you know, working towards premium hospitality or luxury hospitality. And it's, a, it's again, a small uh, venture, which has been started by uh, an entrepreneur. But uh, he, he is doing exceptionally well because he's very well aware about, uh, you know, what are the newer uh, uh, the developments or the trends that are taking place in the industry. So uh, I think from that perspective, um, the world is changing. So India as a world is changing uh, in, in, in that direction. Uh, there are a lot of people who are now, there are a lot of courses in the education curriculum as well. There are a lot of courses which are uh, being driven towards uh, digital marketing or whether it is, uh, you know, marketing as a whole. And uh, a, a lot of... Uh, you know, Western uh, uh, strategies are being taught to uh, students. So there is development from that perspective as well. So when these guys get out into the market to, um, you know, to start working with uh, uh, different companies, they will bring in those trends. They will bring in that knowledge as well. Uh, so to answer to your, uh, your, your second question, which are the markets which are doing well in terms of B2B or B2C? I think B2C is uh, the entire e-commerce e uh, world is, is really addressing the B2C, uh, uh, you know, uh, segment essentially. Uh, 
uh, I mean, I think Gandhi and people are, have actually walked into stores and, uh, uh, you know, of course, that, that the retail industry is viable. But even the, the brick and mortar retail industry is now venturing into an e-commerce model as well. So to, to approach the, uh, the customer or to be, uh, you know, uh, um, um, selling to the customer on that platform. Because today everybody is consuming uh, the internet in so many words uh, and using these platforms on the internet. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, the e-commerce industry now, whether it is uh, apparel, whether it is fashion, whether it is uh, appliances, or whether it is even something as as simple as uh, groceries and buying fruits, buying fish, uh, you know, buying poultry, all of that is available on um, on, on 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 an e-commerce uh, model. So uh, that specifically is is working very well. Uh, if I have to talk about uh, B2B industries, um, there are, uh, uh, you know, I mean, if, if I have to also talk about the FMCG sector, that, that is doing fairly well because you don't stop consuming uh, your daily uh, toothbrushes and toothpastes, uh, you know, on, on a daily basis. So that industry is definitely uh, using, so the last mile, uh, uh, you know, supply chain uh, that uses digital uh, in, a, in a big way. Uh, you know, so whether it is to, to complete the logistics uh, cycle or to whether it's to complete this uh, supply chain cycle or the warehousing model, all of these things are now using uh, digital artificial intelligence uh, platforms in a big, big way. So, uh, you know, I, we had at, at least maybe about four or five years ago, we had not thought about buying fruits online. We had not thought about buying groceries online, but Amazon has really changed the buying pattern of people. Uh, and just taking that to the other extreme uh, end, and of course, not not so much in terms of B2B or B2C, considering I'm a media professional, you know, uh, some, I somehow tend to uh, guide it back into the media uh, function or the media industry. Uh, it's also that, you know, the, the, um, the mode of consumption of, um, of, of media has changed or content has changed per se but otherwise everybody is uh, almost 90% of the population has smartphones today so the the uh, you know the method in which they consume the content has changed but uh, you know the the different uh, distributing uh, platforms pretty much remain uh, digital so Netflix has done a big uh, entry into uh, India. Uh, we have a web series which are going on, which were not thought about maybe about three years ago. Uh, people are, uh, are distributing content on, on web series. Uh, there is, uh, you know, a high amount of uh, uh, digitization which is being used in the content creation space, in the content marketing space as well. So I think everywhere uh, digital medium is, is uh, is really being uh, is is really now the king, you know, in a sense. And uh, anybody, you know, I mean, wanting to set up businesses in that field will really, really do very well. Uh, so long as uh, you know they 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 know which is the particular target market to look at, which is a part particular target segment to look at, and uh, you know, accordingly service that segment. Fantastic. Uh, we've come to the end of the hour. So Aparna, thank you for your time, Vinay. Prab, thank both of you for the insights that you shared today. Today's purpose was to give both an overview and some specific examples. And so I think those of you watching know that if you've got some healthcare questions and you'd like to know more about what's going on there, reach out to Prab, either directly or through us. Uh, Vinay is an expert on getting across the market there in India. And by the way, in any country, uh, he's, 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 his company is helping companies grow everywhere. So get a hold of Vinay if you've got some ideas to get your product or service out to market. And Aparna, thank you for all the things that you do there in Mumbai. Uh, all of you, it's coming up on uh, 9.30 in the evening. So thank you all for taking this extra time in the evening uh, to really share some great information. Before we go, I have about 30 seconds of just quick announcements. Uh, next week, uh, in what, uh, one week plus two days, we have a similar conversation at Thunderbird School of Global Management on Mexico uh, instead of India. So Mexico also has got a lot of different things going on and you should know about, and so tune in there. Also by 
Those of you that haven't done it yet, please consider uh, uh, connecting in tomorrow's event that's at the same time. Professor Roberto Ansis will be talking about uh, growing globally best practices over the next four weeks, one time per week. It's a free event for both members and non-members to get your business growing in other countries. And so uh, we've tested that uh, with Professor Ansis and it was the highest rated program we've ever done. So I highly recommend that you uh, check into that. That's tomorrow. Uh, if this is a recording, you know, you, if this is an event that's happening over the next year with Professor Ansis. And so uh, you, you'll always be able to, to tap into that. Thank you again, everybody, and have a great night there in Thank India. You. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye.